One of the most powerful visualizations of the impact that the coronavirus had on social connectivity was visualized through the ground level and drone aerial footage of cities rendered silent and still. This spatial dread where movement, activity, noise was no longer present in the image, but nonetheless continued to haunt its representation created a profound sense of uncanny isolation. Cities themselves appeared lonely and evoked or projected the very phantoms of human disconnection. For example, the lockdown video, Wuhan, the city under coronavirus, followed the city's bridges, skylines, roadways, into inner city streets that had been emptied of people, of hustle and bustle, of sound. In a city of 11 million people, this sense of emptiness carried through the sensation that the whole world had ground to a halt. And yet, there in the desolate images of Wuhan, a hundred thousand ghosts floated out of the steel. ABC's 7.30 show produced a similar video of Melbourne during lockdown, but this time it was George Sterling from the Australian Boys Choir performing Meet Me in the Middle of the Air over the images of empty parks, stadiums, fairgrounds, laneways and rivers in which I saw ghosts emerge. I live not too far from the now defunct Melbourne Eye. Until very recently, night after night during lockdown, it would be illuminated and the ghosts of tourists laughing and loving would pour out of its ever so still calcified caverns. As the presenters will now go on to explore, the isolation wrought by COVID-19 can be best understood through the idea of the haunted space. Art not simply mediating, reflecting, or speaking to disenchantment and disconnection, but being essentially caught up in its viral, unhomely, ghostly transmissions. And so we begin with Kate, Mur Kate Murray's spooky talk, locked inside the haunted house, streaming horror in isolation. Over to you, Kate. Thank you, uh, Sean, for that beautiful, beautiful introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, today, I'll be looking at streaming horror film and television and how horror media can provide a coping strategy within the context of COVID-19. And afterwards, I'll dive into what I would argue is an especially pertinent horror trope, subject to recent revival and suitable for the direct exploration of isolation and lockdown. And that is, of course, The Haunted House. As Rachel said, during our last round table, speakers looked at how viral science fiction was helping many people deal with the real world pandemic. And my talk follows on closely from Angela Nadalianis's talk on collective social trauma. She looked predominantly at the zombie text and pandemic social media. Today, as we turn inward to the home, I want to look specifically at loneliness and isolation in response to the long-term lockdown, as opposed to the initial response and spread of the virus. So in providing a kind of bridge between the last round table and today, we have South Korean zombie flick Hashtag Alive, which was released on Netflix towards the end of 2020. Yes, it is a zombie apocalypse, but Jun Woo spends a hefty part of the film alone in his family's apartment. When looking at the appeal of the horror genre, Andrew Tudor draws on the connection between audiences and the everyday social event. The mechanisms of pleasure found here is more active, proposing that social agents, in this case the audience, recognise in these films the everyday world of social experience. Like many great zombie narratives, Hashtag Alive not only revels in the gore, but also captures the more everyday experience of uncertainty, loneliness and isolation. Last year, Becky Miller and Johnny Lee highlighted the ability for horror films to communicate grief and help audiences make sense of these experiences, providing strategies for bereaved audiences to regulate their grief. They argue that this is predominantly through the figure of the monster, which can represent the uh, involuntary disruption to one's perspective of the world that is often caused by grief. <laughs> 
pandemic practice, horror fans and morbidly curious individuals are more psychologically resilient during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this is one of the studies that was conducted in 22, sorry, 2020 in direct response to the current pandemic. And as the title suggests, the research findings demonstrate that fans of horror films had a greater resilience towards negative experiences. Similar to Miller and Lee, the study hypothesized that these fictional narratives provided coping strategies which were beneficial in real-world situations. Experiencing negative emotions in a safe setting, such as during a horror film, might help individuals hone strategies for dealing with fear and more calmly deal, deal with fear-eliciting situations in real life. Tanya Horrock highlights the growing popular popularity of binge-watching comfort TV amid extended lockdowns. Drawing on Lisa Perk's study on media marathoning through health struggles, Horrock suggests that the online interactions that come from binge-watching culture help overcome feelings of isolation. COVID-19 il il illuminated the profound the social properties of binge watching in the streaming era through the inventive ways in which people use technologies and platforms to negotiate new forms of digital intimacy and to find ways to watch together whilst physically apart. In Streaming Stress, Pandemic Panic, Heidi Ippolito uh, also explores the changing act of watching, stating that for most of 2020, flocking to movie theatres was no longer an immediate option, but audiences have found other ways to enjoy communal aspects of watching. She brings attention to virtual watch parties on platforms like Twitch, Discord and Zoom, which later inspired the media companies to create official versions of their own, so including Teleparty on Netflix or Group Watch on Disney plus. So not only has watching horror media been argued to help audiences deal with negative emotional experiences, but the nature of viewing in the digital era of social media and streaming services, including Netflix, Stan and Shudder, are helping to bring people together. Whilst Horrock focuses on feel-good comedies like Schitt's Creek and Sex Education, both of which I would highly recommend, we can also consider which horror films are getting attention. Here we can see a few articles that have popped up during the pandemic. Uh, whilst we can relate to certain aspects of these films pertaining to themes of loneliness and entrapment, I would question whether we need to be cautious about that immediate temptation to relate to all aspects of these films without conscious thought or critical engagement with their subtext, as the circumstances that are around these fictional narratives, they do differ from the reality we are currently facing. After a botched robbery, Kylie is shackled with an ankle monitor and plonked back in her supposedly haunted childhood home with her passive aggressive mother. Housebound's surly protagonist is fed up with her house arrest from day one. It's the perfect 2020 mood. It's not hard to imagine why audiences can relate to Kylie's frustration at being kept indoors in this New Zealand horror comedy, a film that Alexandra Helen Nicholas praises as reinvigorating generic tropes. The Shining also found itself on many of these lists as struggling author and alcoholic Jack Torrance is haunted by the supernatural, descends into a violent psychosis and attempts to murder his wife and child. More recently is His House, which was released last year. The film follows a refugee couple who struggle to adjust to their new life in England, uh, having escaped war-torn South Sudan. Director Remy Weeks says that as an asylum seeker, you're given accommodation, but you're not allowed to leave. Uh, when so many horror films are focused on the idea of a haunted house, I thought it was an interesting way to tell a horror story. When you have a house that you cannot leave, it becomes a prison. I think this is a really great genre to tether people to the horrors that we as humanity put on other people and expect them to live through it. So it might be understandable to relate to these characters and even see how viewing these films can have psychological benefits. But let's not forget that Kylie is housebound by an electronic ankle monitor as punishment for her actions, not as part of a pre-meditative effort to prevent the spread of a deadly virus. In The Shining, we see a husband and parent transform into an abuser. 
And whilst these connections aren't meant to be taken literally, I would pose the question of whether or not people should feel their experience of lockdown is comparable to the asylum-seeking characters of his house. There are legitimate concerns surrounding mental health, domestic violence and deaths in isolation within the context of these extended lockdowns. On one hand, these films can help audiences. However, there is also the potential for these films to exacerbate feelings of desperation and uh, perhaps promote negative responses toward unprecedented and preventative safety measures. Now, I am not attempting to answer any of that today, <laughs> but when looking at these films, I felt that it was a complex and important question to raise uh, with you all. Now, returning to the primary focus of this talk, one horror trope that these three films have in common and which provides the perfect haunted and haunting setting for these horrific narratives to unfold is the haunted house, the disturbing and claustrophobic space that the characters are unable to leave. The haunted house sits assuredly within the Gothic horror tradition, foreboding churches, graveyards, the haunted house. The Gothic can be described as a space, an in-between space between life and death. The haunted house becomes a physical embodiment of Sigmund Freud's unheimlich or uncanny, the familiar suddenly made strange, the home that becomes homely. Jack Derrida explains that in some languages in use today can only translate the German expression of an Unheimlich house with a haunted house. To experience the Gothic is a journey of self-discovery across both a physical and metaphoric threshold from one psychological state into another, from the rational to the irrational, and if you're lucky, back again. As an audience, we experience the Gothic. We're held in a state of prolonged hesitation, questioning what is real and what isn't, before finally stepping into the dark and being allowed to revel in our most unrepressed desires. There is pleasure to be found by entering the haunted house. Just as the spectre haunts the haunted house, house, the Gothic itself continues to be a prominent mode of horror, staking its claim within the digital media landscape. For example, it was Netflix that ordered 10 episode adaptations of the Gothic novel Haunting of Hill House and The Turn of the Screw. Now, when bringing together thoughts of the haunted horror trope, sorry, the haunted house trope in horror cinema, new trends of creating and consuming horror content online, and current social anxieties regarding lockdown, Host is a pretty great place to start. This horror film was made entirely through Zoom as six friends come together to conduct a seance. Not only does the accidentally conjured demon appear to haunt the participants' respective houses, but the Zoom room itself is presented as being a digital haunted house. Uh, one of the friends leaves in the opening and doesn't meet their tragic fate until they log back in later. I unfortunately don't have time to delve into the interesting ways that this film transports gothic horror iconography and tropes into the digital sphere, but it is worthy of further discussion. For me, watching this film was a terrifying experience. After two years of socially interacting predominantly through Zoom, I immediately felt uncomfortable being situated as the Zoom participant. Every joke was related specifically to COVID and several lines of dialogue perfectly mirrored exact conversations I had had with my own friends and family. This film felt like a gothic horror story that had been specifically tailored to my own recent experience of lockdown. There was something exciting about knowing that despite this intense personal connection I felt to the film, that there were millions of other viewers that potentially felt the same. I immediately messaged my family telling them to watch it just because I wanted to talk about it with other people. When asked by the Rolling Stone why he decided to focus on a haunted house trope rather than the virus, director Rob Savage said, we were very adamant that this is not a pandemic movie. It is a lockdown movie. It, is more, it was more about isolation. What we wanted to play on was the idea that video conferencing gives you the impression that you're with people, but actually you get these stark reminders that you're not, that you never are. You're very separate and you're very isolated. When asked why did you decide to work with Shudder on this one, he said that they were the only company that really got on board with how they wanted to make it. The fact that we wanted this to be out super quick for people in lockdown, all the other companies basically just wanted to copy and paste the normal structure of making a movie and it was never going to work that way. So I'm excited to see uh, where this area of haunted house horror filmmaking goes in the digital age and in response to the COVID pandemic.
bringing this discussion back home, uh, not only does Australian horror cinema have a long-standing relationship with the Gothic, but recent Australian horror films have contributed to this revival of the haunted house, such as Joel Anderson's Lake Mungo, Jennifer Kent's The Babadook, Donna McRae's Lost Gully Road, and Natalie Erica James's Relic. I'm interested in how the haunted house can continue to be utilised as a space for examining real-world social anxieties. When reviewing Relic, Steve Rhodes uh, writes, we'll soon see if the pandemic has sharpened our appetite for haunted house movies or put us right off them. In recent movies, we've already see, been seeing a new strain of hauntings connected to more contemporary anxieties. Who knows if or how COVID will find its way into this eerie realm, but it's already making life resemble a haunted house horror a lot more. Uh, and that concludes my talk for today so thank you very much for listening uh, for the recording I might just flick through some of these additional references that people can pause on if they ever want to um, there's the films <laughs> here's a few uh, more studies that look at watching horror during COVID and here's a few great texts if you want to look more at the haunted house and the gothic and that is that Thank you so much. Well done, Kate. Come on.